All right, let's begin this service with prayer. Dear Lord, as we come before you in this divine hour, we pray that your presence will be with the people listening, that your heart, that your Holy Spirit will be on their hearts and uh, that they will be here to listen, learn and accept the truths that are going to be promoted in this uh, sermon this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, you'll probably notice that I've got the title here, Why They Won't Listen. Uh, it's actually a subtitle. The greater um, title of the sermon is Fundamental Postmodern Evangelism. Okay. So, we have, what's going on here? Oh, I know what the trouble is. We have a question. We want to ask ourselves, why is it so difficult to reach the secular world today? Well, back around about 1915, there was a gentleman by the name of Charles Templeton, born in Canada. Some of you may be familiar with him. He became a very famous evangelistic pastor. He became a leader of a mass evangelization movement that exploded onto the scene in the 1940s. He became even greater than Billy Graham himself, who was another very well-known evangelist operating at the same time. In 1946, he was listed among those best used of God by the National Association of Evangelicals. However, all was not as it seemed. In a conversation with Graham, he made the following observation. But Billy, it's simply not possible any longer to believe, for instance, the biblical account of creation. <clears throat> the world wasn't created over a period of days a few thousand years ago. It has evolved over millions of years. It is not a matter of speculation. It's demonstrable fact. <laughs> Templeton warned Graham that it was intellectual suicide to not question the Bible and to go on preaching God's word as authoritative. He went on to university to study where his hold on biblical teachings became even more tenuous. The Christian university, that is Princeton, he went to, taught that one had to reject certain parts of Genesis in favour of man's beliefs in millions of years. For a short while after leaving university, he became an official in the World Council of Churches, but his struggle with biblical teachings continued. Eventually, it became all too much, and he resigned from the World Council of Churches and left of the Christian faith. In his autobiography, Farewell to God, Charles Templeton's stated reasons for quitting the Christian faith revolve largely around the issue of creation versus evolution. Regrettably, he died an atheist. Alarmingly, millions of people are following his path. It as if it is, sorry, I'll try that again. It is as if he became an unwitting evangelist for the evolutionary belief. <laughs> Many years ago, when our children were small, our family had a nativity display in the front of our home as part of the upcoming Christmas celebration. The neighbours had young children of about the same age as Hours, so they used to enjoy playing around together. Well, one evening they had to come over and see our Christmas lights and display. One of their children was a very young boy, and when they came to the nativity set, the father told them that there was Jesus lying in the manger. This two year old boy asked the question Who's Jesus? We have a whole generation of young people out there who are asking, who's Jesus? What is sin? What is right and wrong? 
We try to tell them that Jesus loves them. They think he's a dirty old man because their definition of love has become some, so warped that they no longer know what it is. The best they can do is to spout the meaningless mantra, love is love. When we are born, we have three questions that are with us for our whole, whole life. The first one is, where am I from? The second one, why am I here? And the third one, where am I going? The devil doesn't want us to know the true answers to those questions, so he's distracting us, both Christians and pagans, with the false answers to chase after. When St. Paul finally came to Athens in Greece, he addressed a similar problem in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 to 23. <clears throat> he speaks of how the gospel was a stumbling block to the Jews and to the Greeks, foolishness. Well, let's first consider the Jews. In Acts 2, verse 41, we read, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. We observe that in one day there were 3,000 people baptized. We can also legitimately conclude the large majority of the people there were Jews. We have a case here of Jews speaking to Jews. The belief system of both the apostles and listeners had the same foundation, that is, God. Yes, we know about him. Adam? Yes, him too. Messiah? Yes, we believe he will come, so what? You mean he's already been? Oh, okay then. The apostles did not have to start from the basics and try and convince these people of the truth of creation, sin, death, suffering, etc. These people already knew, understood, and believed that. So what was, which Jews was Paul speaking of when he was speaking of stumbling blocks? It would have to had to be the rejectors of Christ as Messiah. Now we'll move to the second story of evangelization in Acts 17, verses 18 to 34. Paul preaches to the Greeks up on Mars Hill at their invitation. Now this passage speaks of Epicurean philosophers. Greek philosopher Epicurus existed from about 341 down to 271 BC. And Democritus, another philosopher, existed even before then, 460 through to 370. So it looked like he was around about the time of Daniel and Babylon. And they held that we came from nothing and that to nothing we will go. So let's take a quick look at that. No, okay. Now, so the, the three answers to the, the, the questions that we mentioned before, where did I come from, why am I here, where am I going? So the first answer for them was, we came from nothing. The second answer was, we have no purpose here. And the third answer is, we die and become nothing again. Now, what this means is that atheists existed before during and after Christ's time on earth. Paul came across the followers of these philosophers when in Athens. If we look at Acts 17, verse 18, we find the following. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange God, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. 
The fact that these followers of such philosophical thought appeared in the biblical record shows that Luke and Paul knew who these people were. They were the precursors to the modern day atheists that were popularized by Darwin and his theory of evolution. In recent times, it has been found that atheists more often than not exist somewhere on the autism spectrum. It would appear that autism renders one blind to supernatural phenomena. And I speculate that Epicurus and his followers may have suffered from the same malady. Now, if we are to then consider the atheist answers to the three questions, we can now consider the creation answers to the three questions. So the three questions initially were, where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? So in an answer to the first question, we were created by God. In answer to the second question, we are here to do God's will and to be saved from sin. And the answer to the third question is to enjoy eternal life with God one day. In Australia, we have religious education in the schools. In my day, it meant that ministers from various churches would come to the school and one would listen to whichever one took their fancy. Ken Ham, initially of Antis International, Antis and Genesis, sorry, um, he speaks of the problems ministers were having getting children in schools to take an interest in biblical things. As he thought about it, he realised that every day the students have been indoctrinated with evolution and essentially been persuaded that the Bible could not be trusted. Such people, upon hearing the gospel, will state the following. For well, thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, which is a long wind of way of saying foolishness. I recall being told the story of Acts 17 verses 18 to 34 by, by some well-meaning teachers who pointed to it as an example of how not to do evangelism for Christ. Now, there's a couple of problems with this argument. First, we find nowhere either inside or outside the Bible, any regret expressed by Paul that he had used the wrong methods, even though he had plenty of time to do so. The second is that there were an unspecified number of people in that audience who had a total change of thinking, including some individuals that were later mentioned by name. Of course, we see the huge number of people in society who became Christians and were subsequently slaughtered by the opposition. The point of these two stories demonstrates that if we want to begin sharing the story of the gospel with pagan people, we first need to address the issue of creation before we can begin to talk about doctrines built on that foundation, like Jesus dying for our sins. Given that evolution surmises that we descended from apes, a new avenue of insulting other races opened up. Darwin speculated that black people were closer to apes than the white man, and it is, this has led to black people being insulted as being monkeys, amongst other things. Now, at the same time, with morality being relative, things like what we see here should not matter. If it feels good, do it. Do what's right for you. It is interesting that in today's world, a man will be told to do what is right, while a woman is told to do what's right for you. And we can see the outcome of this in this particular little graphic. The progress of evolution in our society and our refusal to acknowledge the need to counteract it has done more to hinder the spread of the gospel than virtually any other issue facing the Christian world today. The rejection of the story of creation has allowed postmodernism to raise its ugly head and to allow for the rejection of universal truth. And as you can see, 
this man's got his ears blocked off to the truth. And, of course, we need to consider the answer to this. The importance of this problem can be seen by a quick look at Japanese culture and religion. When you speak of God in Japan, you have to be very careful about stating who he is. <laughs> because of the prevalence of the Shinto religion in that country, and that's their belief in many gods, the people would just add this biblical God that one is talking about to all their other gods. So whenever we use the word God, we have to define who this God is. The God who created and uphold all things, he is the God who is separate from his creation. Unfortunately, we have been persuaded to believe that evolution along with other heresies are simply side issues and are not supposed to get us distracted. The evolutionist very quickly shows us the delusion that this is by proclaiming that we should leave the Bible out of any scientific debate as soon as any argument ensues. In other words, they want us to argue on their ground and not ours. However, as soon as we leave the Bible out of it, then we are in their quicksand. What we need to do is bring the Bible in and demonstrate that science supports the Bible. Then let them explain why it is that evolution has a better way of explaining the scientific facts than the Bible. The Bible tells us that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. Would you lay down your weapons if that's what you were told to do in a fight? I don't think so. Okay, now the Bible teaches us that we should have answers to challenge us, uh, challenge thrown at us to be able to defend our faith. First Peter 3.15 But sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. <clears throat> For many years, the Christian church has been blindsided by the lights of the oncoming evolution train. And like an animal frozen in the glare of the headlights, has not had an effective response. Fortunately, in the last few years, this has begun to change. When Ken Ham realised that the root cause of why students were not interested in religious things, the ministers devised a set of lessons to counteract that philosophy. From that point on, the attitude of the students changed from one of indifference to intense interest. We need to target the foundational beliefs of the community today if we want to achieve victory. Okay, then, so why is the issue of creation and evolution such a big hindrance to the way the Bible's put together? Well, there's an anecdote of an old lady who, upon going to church and hearing the pastor preach that a certain part of the Bible could not be believed, would go home and snip that part of that out of the Bible. As the weeks went by, he preached unbelief in other parts of the Bible, which she duly snipped out. Eventually, the Bible she owned became a very thin book. As one other lady question. We can't believe the first 11 chapters of the Bible. Then when can we start to believe the rest of it? Virtually all of our doctrines have their roots in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. That is, those chapters that most people, especially Christians, find hardest to believe. The evolutionists are in no doubt as to the importance of the outcome of the evolution creation debate. And then we take a quick look here at the doctrines based in Genesis. Creation is Genesis 1 and 2. Man is a special being, Genesis 1 and 2. The flood, Genesis 6 to 9. The rainbow, Genesis 9. Marriage, Genesis 2. Sin, Genesis 3. Salvation, Genesis 3. Death, Genesis 2. Suffering, Genesis 3. Clothing, Genesis 3. Work, Genesis 3. Nations, Genesis 10, 
persecution, Genesis 4, judgment, Genesis 3, Sabbath, Genesis 2. In fact, I'd go one step further and even go so far as to claim that the Bible is the only holy book which explains the existence of different languages in the world today. If we were to consider the all other religious faiths and all other historical records, there is nothing there to explain how the languages of the world came about. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it is acknowledged by various people that evolution is incompatible with Christianity. And I'm going to read this quote. People seem to think that Christianity and evolution do or can go together, but I suggest this is only possible for the intellectually schizophrenic. Biological theory does not require or allow any sort of divine guidance for the evolutionary process. All right, another quote. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fill, fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism, it is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations. No matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated, no matter, and moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Oops, sorry. Now, we're going to go and look at another statement. And it goes like this, Christianity has fought and still fights and will continue to fight science to the desperate end over evolution because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve in the original sin and in the rubble you'll find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. Christianity is, must be, totally committed to the special creation as described in Genesis, and Christianity must fight with all its might, fair or foul against the theory of evolution. As we can see, the enemy is under no illusions as to what the alternatives are. If not evolution, then atheism is not viable and no creator God has to be acknowledged. Hence, there is more fights over creation and evolution than just about any other issue out there in the community today. If the Bible considers creation to be real history, we do not and we do not, sorry, then one of us is wrong. If the Bible is wrong, when so many of our doctrines are grounded in Genesis, then why are we Christians? For this reason, our thoughts need, we turn, need to turn our thoughts to dealing with what is happening today in the world. First of all, we see people who are living secular lives without religion. These people are traveling on what we might call the Greek road. 
you may have seen some of these people and how they react when they meet a street peach in the streets. They are being churned through our education system and any and see anyone preaching the gospel as foolish people who will fade away into obscurity. What is worse is that a number of churches are getting into the compromise and telling our young people that we can believe in millions of years. I'll share an anecdote to you that came from an Adventist discussion forum I was involved with a few years ago. And so this Adventist professor had this to say. On the other hand, a student of mine recently shared an experience while they, they had while attending another Adventist university. The student was taking a science course in which the material was presented solely within the framework of evolutionary theory. One day the student probably asked the instructor whether it would be possible to have some evidence consistent with the creationist view presented in class. I put the term creationist in quotes here because I'm not directly quoting the student or because that term is the most accurate given its general uses, but because it most succinctly describes the student's requests. The instructor's response was if the student wanted to hear about creation, they should walk over to the religion building and talk to a theology professor. This is in an Adventist institution. So as you can see, the battle is being rejoined for our young people, even within our very own universities. My friends, it truly is a battle, but one that can only be won by going back to the beginning. Fortunately for us, there's hope. This topic is one that I find Adventists like to discuss and do so with much vigour and occasionally some hot air. The summits that our church have held on the issue have left me with confidence that as a church we are headed in the right direction in our stand on creation. What we need to see before we begin to talk of the gospel is a need to change our evolutionary glasses of the secular person to the biblical classes, then we can begin to talk about the gospel. In my own experience, I spent time sharing accommodation with a couple of other individuals at a university. I was going there and there was one of the other um, inhabitants of this uh, apartment was a lecturer, the other one was a student fresh out of high school. Well, when it was found out that I was a Bible believing Christian who regarded the world as being created in six days, the debate rumbled along at a low level for a few months, culminating in, I suppose I'm being a bit overly dramatic, but I described it as a fairly explosive fear, but there was a fairly good debate dust up near the end of the year. Well, it so happened that as a consequence of that argument, the student who had come out of high school, he had concluded that evolution was beyond question and now he realised that there was still some huge unanswered questions. And for the first time in the time that I was there, he picked up a Bible and began to read it. So, Creation is the foundation of the Bible, so much so that it underpins the investigative judgment, which is one of the pillars that makes the Adventist Church unique. The chief opponent of the investigative judgment ended up having to discard the creation story rather than admit he was wrong in his interpretation of the 2,300 days. We cannot afford to let the termites of evolution destroy our trust in the Bible. And we need to make it known to our opponents that we see the creation story is much more than a story, but rather real history, 
upon which all of our doctrines are based. In Psalms 11, verse 3, we get the following quote. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? In a movie called They Live, the star of the show put on some special glasses and got to see the way things would really work. We get to see the way things really are depending on our worldview. The glasses of the biblical worldview will see all evidence presented as confirmation of what the Bible teaches. The glasses of the evolutionary worldview will see all evidence as confirmation of the evolutionary view. For example, it is said of those who accept the Bible as truth that when the question is asked, if Noah's flood really happened, <clears throat> what would the evidence be? The answer is going to be billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And what do we find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. It is our biblical worldview that enables us to see things this way. Those biblical worldview glasses give us the ability to see the termites destroying our foundation and to root them out. We need to become ground plows and soften up the hearts of the people so they might will be able to receive the gospel of Christ. Let's put our hand to the plow of creation and demonstrate that it is a true story and that we can trust the Bible from the very first verse. It will be hard. It will be difficult. We will get tired, tired, sorry. But Jesus died for the evolutionist and today's God hater as well. Let's bring <clears throat> this story to them and may they be prompted by the Holy Spirit to accept the gospel. Let's finish with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we pray that you will be with us as we take this gospel to the world. We pray that your Holy Spirit will go in front of us to plough the ground in which we go to throw the seeds of the gospel. People's hearts and minds will be prepared to accept it, to take it on as truth. And we pray that as a consequence of the events of this our last couple of years that people's hearts and minds will be even more receptive to the truth that is before us that it may take them away from from the uh, sorrow that is being brought upon this world and into the joy of salvation we ask these things in jesus name amen <clears throat>